officials. I only then came to realize that this, what this all actually meant, that Ifaluk, like Guam, uh, has a deeply colonial history and that the lives of the people here have led, uh, the lives of the people here have led, were in many ways of their own creative making, and in other ways, they were the result of choices made by people in other remote locations, most recently in Tokyo and in Washington, D.C. So such is no less true in 2009 than it was in 1950 or 1977. As I don't have to tell you here, it's, it's, a, it's the reason why you wait to hear exactly how many tens of thousands of new people and how many new vehicles will be visiting the island about how many overflights and aircraft carrier visits and toxic trickles or spills. It's why you wait not for rent payments for the land and the trouble, but for the dollar amount of payments for some percentage of the externalized costs of the military operations that the people of Guam will bear. That is your colonial history and colonial situation. And I say this with all respect to those who take their US citizenship seriously and want to make claims to full citizenship on the foundation of the limited citizenship that, they, that you now have. And I say that with respect to the military members of the audience who are simply doing their duty to the U.S. civilian leadership who have sent them here to establish and run the bases in service to the United States. And I say it with the knowledge that many of Guam's citizens have been acting in the great good faith that they should be able to make their own choices about whether Guam becomes even more of a battleship or not. But social science will call it nothing more than colonial when people have not historically chosen their most powerful leaders and have been told to background their own national identity in favor of that of the power which has ultimate rule. The US presence in Guam is properly called imperial because the US is an empire in the strict sense of the term, as used by historians and other social analysts of political forms. Social science has another relevant concept for Guam's situation, and that is the concept of militarization, which I want to talk about this afternoon. Um, I, I'll begin with its, its definition, and again, this is one that's widely used in, in social science. Um, uh, well, actually, I should first tell you where we're headed. Um, I'm going to talk about the contemporary U.S. spacing system. Uh, I'm going to ask the question of what bases are for, why does, why does any country, and the United States in particular, have them or have so many of them. Uh, give a very short history of U.S. overseas basing, and then ask whether Guam's bases are domestic or foreign bases. And finally talk um, in very quick overview of the whole question of the uh, what are the externalized costs of bases based on the research uh, that I have done in Fayetteville, North Carolina, as well as what I'm beginning to understand about Guam's situation. But the concept of militarization um, and again, everybody can read this, although if, I suppose if the lights were a little bit lower, it might, some of the words that are gonna come up are a little smaller, it might pop out a little better, um, if we could do that. Um, so militarization is a, a concept that it is basically uh, describes how material and cultural changes occur uh, in, in certain directions. And in particular, um, it's defined as an increase in labor and resources uh, human labor and, and material resources that are allocated to military purposes, and the shaping of other institutions, educational, health institutions even, uh, in some harmony or synchrony with, with, those, um, with military goals. And militarization also refers to a shift in culture, in the, the beliefs and values that people hold. Uh, societies that are less militarized tend to have a different kind of uh, sort of pattern of values and, and orientations than societies that are more militarized. Okay, it's, it's a process that helps describe uh, why 14-year-olds are in uniform in many U.S. schools and on Guam and carrying, carrying proxy rifles in JROTC units, uh, why a fifth to a quarter of high school graduates from Guam enter the military, and why the identity of the island has over time shifted from a land of farmers to a land of war survivors to a land of loyal Americans to a land that is proudly now, in many minds, the tip of the spear, that is, a land that is a weapon. This historical change, the process of militarization, has been visible to some, but more often hidden in plain sight. Uh, 
Um, I want to talk about the, the bases. Um, again, many of you already have lived with them your whole lives, and, and so there's many things that I'll, I'll tell you that you, of course, already know. But I, I want to, I think there's value still in my talking about this because uh, to study bases with the tools of anthropology and the perspectives of social science allows us to question some of the common sense that uh, exists about those bases and to see invisible processes. And like most social phenomena, bases are often hidden in plain sight. They are normalized. Um, that's a social science concept that refers to the idea that um, something becomes taken for granted. Something that is actually often quite unusual, remarkable, uh, is simply treated as the way things are and, and as if it were immutable and as if things could be no other way. That's the process of normalization. Uh, your bases have been partially denormalized by the enormous uh, growth that's projected for them that's already begun, but much remains invisible, I think, accepted again in a way, in a word, normalized. In addition, I think there's value in talking about the bases uh, with, the, with the tools of social science because uh, like any social phenomena in which power is involved, and, and obviously the U.S. military, the U.S. as a nation is extremely powerful, um, whenever power is involved, the effects of social processes can be systematically hidden. Um, they're not just uh, taken for granted, but they're systematically hidden by advertising, by public relations work, by, uh, by fear even. So military-based communities are in many ways distinctive sociologically and anthropologically, and as distinctive as the military bases they sit next to because they respond in almost every way to the presence of those bases. Right? Um, it's not simply an economic effect, it's a cultural effect, it's a social effect, it's an um, uh, environmental effect, and so on. Bases and communities are not simply independent neighbors, as again, I don't need to tell you here, but over time they become conjoined twins, although one always much more powerful than the other. So um, I want to just look at the U.S. military basing system and, um, oh, uh, let me also just point out the, the U.S. military, um, the, the militarization process is more generally a, a United States historical process. Um, the U.S. military spending uh, was as, again, an inflation, these are inflation control dollars, uh, was, um, was quite small before World War II, as you can see here, um, and then uh, pops up for World War II, and then uh, there's a rapid demobilization, and then comes up again for the beginning of the Cold War, and the Korean War, and then the Vietnam War, and then the Reagan buildup, and then remarkably, and this is, again, inflation control dollars, uh, has uh, popped up to a level of, again, this is $1 trillion uh, annually. This number is not uh, fully complete yet, so you can disregard 2009. But as you can see, it's the Department of Defense budget. It's the budget for the military that's in other uh, federal agencies, like Department of Energy and so on. Um, and uh, as you can see, it's, it's, a, it's a quite a dramatic increase. So the U.S. basing system is, uh, emerges from this context of really quite massive funding of, of military projects, um, including, you know, again, JRTC. But here is the U.S. military uh, basing system. And I suppose uh, there may be one or two slides where things will be cut off at the, at the bottom if it remains a little bit low like that. So maybe we could pop it up just a bit. Um, the U.S. has officially over 190,000 troops and 115,000 civilian employees uh, massed in 909 military facilities in 46 countries and territories. There, the U.S. military owns or rents 795,000 acres of land, 26,000 